Good morning, Oak Brook Community Church family. Um, it's another Sunday where we have the privilege of gathering together for worship, and we're just so glad and grateful that you've joined us today. But ultimately, we're just thankful to God for His faithfulness. Uh, we're thankful for the ability to gather in this way, in this season, despite this kind of shelter-in-place mandate. We're so grateful that the gospel doesn't cease and that God's faithfulness is unending. It's never ceasing, and it remains. And so today, we just want to sing about who God is. We want to declare God's goodness back to himself and say, God, you're worthy of it all. You're worthy of our praise. You're worthy of our adoration. And so that's what we invite you to this morning. And so myself, on behalf of myself and Kelly and Genesis here today, we're, we're glad that you're with us. We just encourage you to join with us in worship this morning. Amen. So let me pray for us this morning um, before we enter into this time of worship. But uh, let's just give God all the praise and all the glory. Father, we just come before you this morning, God, thanking you with joy in our hearts, remembering that, God, it's only because of your love for us that we can even be a part of your business, doing your business, worshiping you, God. It's a privilege to worship, God. And we consider it that this morning, just to say, God, thank you for the privilege of being called sons and daughters of the Most High. So God, we give you this time, be glorified in our midst. May this worship and, and this praise that we bring to you this morning be like a sweet, fragrant offering to you, Jesus. We love you, God. We honor you. We thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Walking around. 
Lord, you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And today, God, we just stand on the promise of who you are, that you're a good father, you're a good shepherd. So, God, we just say thank you. We worship you, Jesus. Praise you, God. Ah uh-huh. 
just to make it a, a sacred space before the Lord. Just to worship God right where you're at and declare His promises over your life that He's for us and not against us. That He's a sure foundation. That He's steadfast. That He's unwavering. That He's our Savior, our Deliverer. Just declare that to the Lord this morning. Thank you, worship. Thank you, God. Listen to what the Word says, Hebrews 4, verse 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, 
let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet without sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Lord Jesus, we thank you today that you are enough. We thank you today that you are our great high priest and you are in position to bring us before our Father, to represent us. And we thank you today that we, because of you, have the grace and the strength to come boldly before your throne and, and cry out to you, knowing that you hear us, knowing that you feel what we feel, knowing that you identify with who we are and where we are, and yet you do it perfectly as you bring us to the Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Do a work in our hearts today. May we encounter you afresh. May your word come alive in us. May we, in every way, in our homes, in our, in our lives, in our workplaces, in our church, may we live with that conviction and that knowledge and that assurance that Jesus is enough. We love you, Lord. You're our all in all. You meet our needs. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, church, for praying, for worshiping. It's great to be together again today and, and have an opportunity in this unique fashion to share. And I believe in the weeks ahead, we're gonna see opportunity on Sunday in the building together, not yet, but it's coming. And a good sign of that is right here in Illinois, we officially moved to phase three of Restore Illinois, which means groups of 10 can gather inside the church. And we're gonna begin that with some of our life groups this week, following protocol as we gather with keeping social distance and wearing masks inside and the rest of that. You can get the details on our website, the communication of things that will begin to happen at the building step by step. So again, that's groups of 10. But I, I want to let you know as well that next Sunday, I'm excited to announce this. Next Sunday, we will have our morning service online, just like this in this forum. And we will finish the service, but instead of next Sunday going into a Zoom call, which we've been doing the last several weeks, we're actually gonna have what may be termed a second service in the evening outside. Yes, you heard it right. We're gonna gather six o'clock on June 7th in the back parking area, and you can stay in your car with your windows down, or you can step out and social distance properly on the lawn, following protocol, wearing masks, if you step out of your car or away from your car. But we'll have some worship, prayer, and a time of communion, Lord willing, uh, that we can, we can do outside. So this is all weather permitting, Sunday evening, June 7th at six o'clock. Join us for that, plan for that, and look on our website, our other means of communication that come out this week to all of you that are part of the Oakbrook family. Uh, that The details will be there, but we are excited for that potential time of actually gathering together in person. I wanna say today, we have a number of great things following this. First, I wanna say that, that Dolphy and Gil Maunda are with us by video with an introduction and a sharing of their ministry, but they're our missionary guests today. They're not, they're not new to OBCC. We love them. They've shared and ministered here several times, but, but I want you to take in what they share and add them to your prayer list and, and be standing with them as they prepare to head back to Tanzania. So listen in on them. And then if you want to give, you can give uh, yeah, in the means that we offer online for all of our other giving. And so you can give to them as well. And then uh, following their mission window, Joshua Edmond is our guest speaker today. 
He'll be bringing the word, and it's a, a, a right now word, so listen into that. And then following his message, the service ends, and we go into the Zoom call. We've had some great weeks together these last few weeks, different interaction, but today we're gonna have a very pointed conversation. Today is Pentecost Sunday, and we're gonna bring that into the discussion because on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit was outpoured, people from nations and all ethnicities heard the message of the gospel in their language by the move of the Holy Spirit. And, and just what the church represents coming out of Pentecost and what the church should be. And then in light of current events, we're just gonna have some conversation. Joshua and Samika are gonna be with us on that call as well and others. So join us for the Zoom call today right after the service. Just before we, we step into the mission window, I wanna remind you that you can give. You can give by text to give. The information is on your screen right now. You can give online through our website. Just go and hit the appropriate uh, settings and, and you can give online. And, or you can give by mail or even drop off your mail at the church office entrance box. So thank you for your faithfulness. When we steward well, we are simply giving back to God what is rightfully his, it's already his. And so we, may we be those good stewards of all that God has given us. Let's continue the service. Here now is Dolphy and Gil Maunda. Good morning, everybody. We're sorry we couldn't be with you this morning. We're in Wisconsin and uh, we're thanking you for your prayers. We thank you that you continue to pray for the Datog and the ministry to the Datog. Tentatively, we're going back in July or the beginning of August. Thank you so much for prayer and uh, the prayer is working because he, I remember the time we were asking people for prayer for missions. We have one church, but right now we have 26 church planting in the bush and this is happening because people pray. So continue pray, just please don't give up. And just pray for those people we heard, they're very sick for Corona. And uh, we want to continue preaching about Jesus, even like this time is so crazy time, but we want to preach, people are coming to know Christ. So thank you so much and uh, we bless you. We pray with you guys and God bless, take care.
Well, good morning, OBCC. I hope you are well uh, this morning. Hey, if you have your Bible or your Bible app, would you be so kind to turn to 1 Kings 19? That's 1 Kings 19. We're going to look at uh, verses 1 through 18 throughout this message. Cool? Cool. Hey, before we dive into the text, I have a question for you. Have you ever ran from a fight before? One time, I remember like it was yesterday, uh, I ran from a fight. So let me paint the picture. I was in the sixth grade and had just transferred to a new school. Uh, this school was twice the size of the school I previously attended. Um, well, me, the young guy that I was back then, I had to make sure people knew that I was a tough guy. So me being this tough guy in the sixth grade decided to mess with a young lady. That's right. I decided to mess with a young lady in my class. Why did I do that? I said some words to her that were not very nice. She then told her brother. Her brother then told his best friend who just so happened to be the toughest guy in the school. Well, the toughest guy in the school uh, told uh, the young lady I was messing with to tell me that after school, He's going to handle me. Now, handling me uh, did not mean that he was going to be gentle. It meant that, yeah, he was going to rough me up a bit. Me trying to be the tough guy that I was, I acted like I wasn't afraid. But on the inside, I was filled with fear. I was trembling. After school, I headed to my grandmother's house. Now, this was something that my brother and my cousins did every day after school. We would go to my grandmother's house and then our parents would pick us up after they got off work. Now, as I'm walking to my grandmother's home, who do I see? That's right. I saw the toughest guy in the school. He said to me with some umph and some force in his voice, say what you said to my little sister now. Now, of course, that wasn't his real little sister, but he treated her like uh, she was his little sister. He said, I'm about to get you. And what did I do? The moment he said, I'm about to get you, I ran. I ran to my grandmother's house and I hid in isolation. I did. Now, here's the deal. We all struggle with fear in some ways. Maybe your fear isn't a middle school tough guy, but your fear might be your finances. You just don't know what to do because financially you are at the end of your rope. Or maybe you're, you're struggling with relationships and you fear if the relationships you've worked hard to improve and strengthen will stand the test of time. Perhaps it's your health. Yes, COVID-19 is raging and many people have deep fear and trepidation over that. But for others, uh, it's, it's a real report. For some of you, you might have received a real report from the doctor that is not favorable and it's causing you to fear. Well, here we are uh, in this series, Quarantine, a biblical perspective on seasons of isolation. And in this narrative today, we find a prophet on the run. Yes, that's right. A prophet, one who had done amazing exploits for God, ran for his life because he was afraid he would die. Now, this prophet, uh, Elijah, he ministered during the reign of King Ahab. Uh, this King Ahab worshiped Baal. And according to 1 Kings 16 and 30, he did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. We pick up in this story in 1 Kings 18, atop of Mount Carmel, where Elijah is in an intense match with 450 prophets of Baal. Both have slaughtered a bull, put it on the altar and cried out to their God to light a fire underneath. Now, the prophets of Baal went first. They went crazy. They were shouting and dancing and, and slashing themselves with swords and spears from sundown to sun up. But no fire came. Elijah, on the other hand, he built an altar of the Lord and he poured water on it and called down fire from the sky that set everything on fire. Elijah won the battle and had the prophets of Baal slaughtered. Ahab now told his wife Jezebel what Elijah did to the prophets of Baal. And here we are in chapter 19 of 1 Kings, where we will spend the duration of our time together. In verse 2, Jezebel uh, sends a messenger to Elijah saying that she is going to take his life the next day. So what did Elijah do? He did what I did in middle school. He ran. 
He ran like his life depended on it. He ran without apologizing. The prophet of God ran. He ran to a place called Beersheba. He left his servant there, according to verse three. Then he went on a day's journey into the wilderness. Elijah went into isolation. After this, Elijah did what any good prophet would do. He prayed. When did Elijah pray, though? He prayed that God would take his life. So here it is. This great man of God is isolated, exhausted, fearful. He doesn't know if he's going to live and he's depressed. And Elijah meets God there. He meets God right where he is. Elijah has an encounter with God in isolation. Elijah was on the run. He was afraid, but he meets God. I don't know who I'm talking to this morning, but maybe you are feeling like Elijah. Maybe you're feeling isolated. You're feeling exhausted. You're feeling fearful for your life or depressed. Let me say this to you. God wants to meet you right where you are. He wants you to encounter him right where you are. Well, let's pick up at verse five. But before we look at verse five, let me pause and say this in this season that we're in. You can encounter God in isolation. Yes, in this season, you can encounter God in isolation. And Elijah encountered God and you can encounter God too. So that's what I want to talk to you for the uh, next few minutes we have together. And that's this encountering God in isolation. So God help us to encounter you in powerful ways, I pray, as we minister your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, like I said, we can encounter God in isolation. The first thing that we can encounter in isolation is we can encounter God's provision in isolation. Yes, that's right. We can encounter God's provision. Look at verses uh, five through eight. The text tells us that after journeying for a while and praying, Elijah went to sleep under a tree. An angel interrupted Elijah's sleep. Hold up. Let's 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 stop right there. And let me say this. See, sometimes we just walk past angelic activity in scripture like it's just an angel. I mean, an angel, an actual angel was Elijah's alarm clock. Okay, okay, back to the story. Uh, The angel uh, told uh, Elijah to get up and eat. So Elijah, he gets up and he he eats. And what what seems to be uh, hard for us to see in this text, at least for me, it is, was the fact that this this food came out of nowhere. That's right. Uh, Elijah has cornbread and a jug of water right in front of him that just appears. Yes, it was. The Bible says in first Kings 19 and six, right next to Elijah's head uh, were bread baked over hot stones and a jug of water. You know, God will do the same for us. He will provide for you and give you what you need in isolation. He will provide for you and you will not know where the provision came from or where the resources came from. But all you can say is that was God. It might not be hot water, uh, cornbread uh, or or water, but it might be joy that's unexplainable. It it might not be uh, hot bread and water, but it might be love from the spirit, the Holy Spirit of God that warms your weary soul. God is able to provide for you. Elijah did exactly what the angel uh, told him to do as well. In verse six, we see uh, that Elijah, he ate and he drank and then he went back to sleep. After sleeping now for a second time, the angel woke him up and again encouraged him to eat and to drink for the journey ahead. And again, verse eight tells us that in obedience to the angelic command, uh, Elijah ate and drank. This act of obedience gave him the fuel he needed to make it to his new destination. 
And that is what I want to tell you today. God is going to give you the strength you need to make it to your new destination. Yes, you might be tired. You might be overwhelmed. You might be weary. But the fact of the matter is God will provide for you. God will offer you care. And here's the thing. Your act of obedience will give you the fuel you need to make it to your new location. Yes, it will. Let's look again at verse 8b. The Bible says that Elijah, he traveled for 40 days and 40 and 40 nights until he reached Hor, the mountain of God. Because of this act of obedience, Elijah had the energy and the stamina to make it to his new destination, Horeb. Now, Horeb was significant, but what was so significant about Horeb? Horeb had another name, and that was Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai was the place where God led Moses and the Israelites to after liberating them from the chains of Egyptian captivity. Now, I believe that God wanted to remind the prophet uh, that if Pharaoh wasn't a problem, you shouldn't be sweating Jezebel. Now, if God can handle Pharaoh and Jezebel, he can handle whatever situation, circumstance or scenario we might find ourselves in. If he can provide protection and he did for the children of Israel and Elijah, he can provide for you, too. God is a great provider. He is Jehovah Jireh, our provider, and he wants us to encounter his provision. But not only does God want us to encounter his provision, he wants us to encounter his presence as well. Let's look at verses 19, excuse me, 9 through 13. We can encounter God's presence in isolation. Verse uh, nine uh, down at the bottom of nine says this. Uh, God asked uh, Elijah a very direct question. And this question was, what are you doing here, Elijah? God is asking Elijah, why are you in this place? This question caused a lot to come out of Elijah. He answered in verse 10. I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, but the Israelites have abandoned your covenant, torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left and they are looking for me to take my life. Elijah feels like he is all alone serving God. Have you ever felt that way before? Have you ever been serving the Lord and reading scripture, but it seems like the people closest to you are melancholy or in a malaise. There's a fog over them at best and just plain or just plain persecutes you at worst. I mean, I read my Bible, you might say. I, I, I share my faith. I'm on fire for God, but it feels like I am all alone. Do you ever feel that way? Well, God responds to Elijah telling him to go stand on the mountain in his presence. I would suggest that in this time we are living in, all of us need a mountain encounter with God. And here's what I love about God. He is, as A.W. Toes would say, and I say this all of the time, he is waiting to be wanted. He wants us to encounter him. But not only does he want us to encounter him, we need to encounter him. Scratch that. I need to encounter him. So this is what God tells Elijah in verse 11. He says, go out and stand on the mountain in the Lord's presence. Elijah encounters God in a life altering way. And here's what happens. At that moment, the Lord passed by. A great and mighty wind was tearing at the mountain and was shattering cliffs, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a voice, a soft whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Now, I have to confess to you, I love the dramatic. I do. 
I'm all about the noise. I love the big. I love the extravagant when it comes to encountering God. This is probably why I love my music loud. And here's the deal. I think there are theological arguments that we can make for loud in worship and loud in experiencing God. And I've encountered God in loud and dramatic ways. And I've encountered the wind of the spirit of God. But in this text, God doesn't work like that. If you're wired like me, you probably were sitting up at your seat on the edge of your seat, probably anticipating something dramatic to happen. You were probably expecting God to be in the mountain tearing or the wind or the earthquake or the fire. But God was not in any of that. He was in a voice. A soft whisper, a voice, a soft whisper. You know, I've been thinking about this encounter over the past week, and I wonder, why did God speak to Elijah in that soft whisper? Why didn't he scream at Elijah? Why didn't he move in a more dramatic way? And I'm sure many of us could come up with a whole host of reasons. I'm sure there are a number of people who can argue me down as to why this happened. But I resonate with the sentiments of this scholar who writes, the point of God speaking in this in this small voice was to show Elijah that the work of God need not always be accompanied by dramatic revelation or or manifestations. Divine silence does not necessarily mean divine inactivity. Do you hear what the, the scholar said? Divine silence does not necessarily mean divine inactivity. The way in which you and I encounter God may not always be in the big and dramatic. Sometimes a soft whisper from God is all we need. I mean, like I said, I love the the, the dramatic. I love the powerful. But if I can just get a soft word from my Lord, that is enough for me. God may be speaking to you, too, but it might not be in the dramatic. It might be in the whisper. It might not be in the powerful. It might be in the silence. Let me encourage you to ask God to help you see him at work in more subtle ways this week. Ask him to help you to encounter him in ways that you're not used to. God is moving and he wants us to encounter him, but it just might be through a soft whisper. He wants us to know this, that his soft whisper is more powerful than any scream or taunt we might experience from this world and from our adversary. We can encounter God in isolation. We can encounter God's provision. We can encounter God's presence. And finally, we can encounter God's purpose. Let's look at uh, verses 13 through 18. Now, after this subtle but life changing encounter Elijah had with God in verse 13 uh, at the end there, God asked Elijah again, what are you doing here? Elijah gave God the same answer he gave him in verse 10. Though Elijah encountered God, he still let God know why he was in the place that he was in. God did not respond to Elijah's response with condemnation. No, what God did, what God did is he gave Elijah purpose. Elijah encountered God's purpose. Listen to what God says in verses 15 through 17. God says, go and return by the way you came to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you are to anoint You are to anoint Haziel as king over Aram. You are to anoint uh, Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Mahola, as prophet in your place. Then Jehu will put to death whoever escapes uh, the sword of Haziel. And Elisha will put to death whoever escapes the sword of Jehu. God says, Elijah, I know where you have been. I know where you are right now and I know where you're going and I know that I have a purpose for you and this purpose is new. It is fresh. It is tailor made for you. 
Go, anoint a king. Go, anoint a prophet. Be my hands and my feet. Be my representative. I am giving you a purpose that is bigger than you, Elijah. This purpose is about me and the kingdom I'm setting up. And that is what God wants to say to us this morning, too. In the midst of isolation, in the midst of COVID-19, in the midst of despair and what feels like death all around us, God says there's a purpose for you. There's a purpose that I have for you. God has a purpose and a plan for us, guys. He has a purpose and a plan. And isolation is not the end of the story. The wilderness is not the end of the story. Death and decay are not the end of the story. God has the final word and his purposes will always, always prevail. You know, I love what Apostle Paul says in Romans 8, 28. He said, all things work together for the good of them who love God and are called according to his purpose. We have a purpose and the purpose is given to us by God, for God and for his glory. And you need to know that you have purpose this morning. But not only do you have purpose, he's going to surround you with people who will help you uh, execute the purpose that he placed on your life. Yes, he will. You will not be alone. Just like he told Elijah, you will not be alone. He said in verse 18, but I will leave 7000 in Israel, every knee that has not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. I have 7,000 other people who are living on purpose. I have 7,000 people who have not bowed to Baal. I know the enemy of your souls wants uh, us and you to think that we are the only ones left, but we are not. God has people all over the globe and in your spheres of influence who have not bowed. And because God is so wanting you to encounter his purpose, he will gift you. If you don't have those people, he will gift you with people. People to help advance the purpose that he's placed on your life. You are not alone. God's purpose will prevail in your life and he will send people to help you live out of your purpose. We can encounter God during isolation. I know like Elijah, some of us are overwhelmed by the circumstances we might find ourselves in. Maybe you lost a job. Maybe you lost a loved one or maybe you are like me. You're just completely over this season that we're in. Let me encourage you, my brothers and my sisters, as I encourage myself, you can encounter God in the midst of your situation. You can encounter his provision. You can encounter his presence and you can encounter uh, his purpose and you will leave out better on the other side of this than you came in. How long will this season last? I don't know. But one thing I do know is that God sees us and he will see us through this just like he did the prophet Elijah. So here's my simple prayer for you. I pray that in the midst of isolation, you will encounter God's provision. You will encounter God's presence and you will encounter God's purpose in this season. God bless you and may the Lord keep you and may the Lord make his face shine on you and give you peace in this season. God bless.